Good evening. Getting dressed. Thank you so much. Good evening and good Friday. your prosperity. Save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Anadonai, 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 Hoshiana, Anadonai, 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 Hatsli. Hoshiana, Hoshiana, Baruch Abba, B'Shem Adonai, Hoshiana, Hoshiana, Baruch Abba, Baruch Abba, Baruch Abba, B'Shem. Adonai, Baruch Abba B'Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's sing one more time. Hoshiana, Hoshiana, Baruch Abba B'Shem Adonai. Hoshiana, Hoshiana, Baruch Abba. Baruch Haba Baruch Haba B'Shem Adonai I don't O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You who set your glory above the heavens. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. And when the people cried out, seeing Yeshua riding in on a donkey, as Zechariah prophesied, they said, why don't you tell the people to keep quiet? You know how the people tell you folks at Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills. They just say, keep quiet. Stop talking about Jesus, don't they? <laughs> but then 
It was said by Yeshua. He quoted Psalm number 8. That's a psalm we're going to sing together. And he said, haven't you heard out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have perfected praise. Oh, Lord, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him now this is your part here we go oh lord our lord how excellent is your name in all of the earth oh lord how excellent is your name oh lord our lord how excellent is your name in all of the earth oh lord how excellent is your name that's wonderful and the clapping is completely kosher for this song tonight and we know that our accuser you still with the praises of singers, we infants and babes whom you ordained. What is a man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him. Why don't we stand together and sing, shall we? Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Oh. Our Lord, how excellent is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, how excellent is your name. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, how excellent is your name. Your, your holy name. Given so freely for us to claim the name Yeshua, you came a little lower than the angels, and Lord, you humbled yourself. Jesus, you humbled yourself. Only to be exalted, Messiah, you're exalted. That's why we clap and sing, oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, how excellent is your name, oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all of the earth, oh Lord, how excellent is your name. You sing, oh Lord, our Lord, I'll sing the Hebrew, here we go, one, two, three, oh Lord, Adonai, Adonai Nu. Yeshua, bless your holy name, Baruch Hashem Adonai. We love your name. One more time. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, how excellent is your name. How excellent is your name. How excellent is your name. Praise your name, Lord. Thank you. And you may be seated. Amen and amen. How excellent is your name name, Lord Yeshua, Messiah Jesus.
in the beginning, he spoke. He spoke in everything we know, the earth, the stars, even us, all came into existence. By his word, by his son, and he loved us. Then we fell, but thankfully, God spoke his plan of redemption there, in that moment. I find it really interesting, the symbolic fabrics we see throughout the Bible, and especially throughout Jesus' life and ministry. At his birth, we see him wrapped in swaddling cloths. This was an act used in preparation for a sacrificial lamb. They would wrap each area of the lamb to signify its perfect condition. No blemish, no spot, no defect, a perfect sacrifice. In the Gospels, we see the people lay down their garments, their fabrics, on the road for Jesus, proclaiming he is king. Only a few short days later, Jesus would be betrayed, taken into custody, and tried as a criminal. They mocked him and gave him a purple cloak like a king would wear. They crucified him and fulfilled prophecy by casting lots for his garments. And upon his death, the veil was torn, the final symbol of our access to the Holy of Holies. But what difference does any of it make? What do we gain from a prophecy being fulfilled but a Jesus hanging dead on the cross? Quite honestly, nothing. But thank God, the story doesn't end there. Yes, and Father, we come before you this day, this evening. And Lord, we come with grateful hearts, Father, thankful hearts. We come with our humanity in our hands before you. Lord, we ask you to speak to us tonight out of your word. We, Lord, created in your image, but so severely fallen from our choices, from our first mom and dad, Adam and Eve, to this very moment. And the world not only mirrors that, it bears the scars and the bruises of a world in rebellion against Almighty God. But Father, we thank you that you stepped in and you fulfilled so many Old Testament prophecies that it was beyond obvious. And the ones that remain to be fulfilled, we trust and know you will do as you have spoken. Great and mighty is our God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lives. He lives. Having gone to the cross... the Son of God, 
We praise you, Lord God. Speak to us this night. And Lord, we must confess, though, we put the the stage in simplicity, the lighting in simplicity. This day, historically, was a heavy day, but we must confess it's, it's as though we're like a horse ready to leave the gate because we know how this ends. <laughs> and the sacrifice of the Lamb of God is not the ending. And we praise you for that because Sunday will be here soon enough. And what a glorious moment that is. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Church family, as we prepare our hearts tonight for communion and for worship on this Good Friday, many of you know, maybe if there's just one of you who you may not know, it's good for me to repeat the fact that Good Friday stands for the word good is ascribed to God only. Good morning, good afternoon, good Friday, good evening is God's morning, God's afternoon, God's evening, God's Friday. And so as we gather here together, we're looking at a message this evening titled, One for All and All for Themselves. (laughs) One for All, that would obviously depict the ministry and the life of Jesus. And then all for themselves speaks about us and our humanity. What do I mean by that? By one for all and all for ourselves. But in Romans chapter 3 verse 23, Paul speaks to the Romans and he says, For all have sinned. That word in the Greek means to miss the mark or standard of perfection. All have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Everything that God expects. Listen, everyone. For entrance into heaven has never been established. It always has been. God is holy. God is perfect. God is pure. God is just. And the Bible tells us that he's so pure that he cannot look upon evil. And by the way, that's a great theological argument and dissertation on the person of Christ. How did God maintain his holiness and yet at the same time be our redeemer? How is he the one that is pure and unapproachable spirit, but yet reach out to us in love? Now, God never has a problem. He doesn't have, he didn't have a problem then. He doesn't have a problem tonight. God has no problems. But what God did in that sending his only lamb into this world to be our ultimate sacrifice can only have been thought up by him. We were incapable, we were unable, and if that brings you any doubt in your mind, then you ought to read the Bible in its entirety. And the Bible is the one that tells us that we have in fact sinned and fallen short of what God's glory is all about, and yet the same God that tells us that we're way off the mark is the same God that says, but I've brought you the answer. The Bible tells us from ancient times, listen, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20 says, not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. 1 John chapter 1 verse 8 begins by saying, listen, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I told you uh, years ago, it's been years ago, we were going through the gospel of Luke and I remember teaching And uh, I went right out to the foyer and there was a young man standing there and he said, I want you to know, I take issue with your sermon today because you said, all have sinned. I said, that's right. He said, I have never sinned. (laughs) And he was with his girlfriend, which was convenient for me. (laughs) And I said, is that true? He's never sinned. And you know what she did? She didn't say a word. She didn't have to. She went like this. That said it all. The truth is not in us. Verse 9, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. Powerful. But you know it's true. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, the Bible says, For Christ also suffered once for sins the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. 
What a great word that is. So let's step back in time. 2,000 years ago in history, as recorded in the scriptures, to the city of Jerusalem, and to the temple precinct known as the Praetorium. The Praetorium was the law enforcement facility. It was police headquarters, so to speak, for Rome's centurions and the Praetorian guards. They're the ones that controlled the Temple Mount activities, make sure that it was kept under Roman limits and Roman rule. And so they were gathered together as we pause on this Good Friday. Number one thing we notice, church family, is this. As we consider our scriptures, that as we look at this, in John chapter 19, verses 1 through 7, we see this. That on this day in history, everyone was on trial. I want you to think about that for a moment. Of course, nobody thought that back then. So you're a time traveler right now. You are 2,000 years ahead. And you know how we often say that, uh, you know, having knowledge looking back is, is, you know, 2020. We have perfect sight looking back. Well, my friend, looking forward, you, you don't have really any sight at all unless you look at it through the word of God. But I'm asking you to look back and the Bible would announce to us that everyone was about to be put on trial. John 19, verse 1, so then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. That word scourge means beat him to the point where many Roman criminals would die from the scourging. I don't have the time to get into the Roman uh, flagellum, what that looks like. You can see it in history. You can see it in uh, YouTube or something. They've got images of them. Uh, a long handle. So sometimes the centurion could use both hands and it had nine leather straps with bone, glass, and rock as it would extract pieces of flesh out of the victim's back. Josephus writes that many victims had their lungs exposed to the atmosphere. You could see their ribs and their lungs working while they were beaten, being beaten. Jesus was scourged. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put, a, they put, him, put it on him, a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him there with their hands. That word means open palm. They didn't punch him. They hit him with their palms wide open. That's horrific because Jesus is also blindfolded at this moment. A punch would have been more merciful. But an open palm slap across the face or head could break the neck. And they struck him there with their hands. Pilate went, uh, then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. So Pilate's representing Rome and the Gentiles and all that is not the Sanhedrin, not the Pharisees, not the Sadducees. And then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, that's Jesus, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him for I find no fault with him. Now what a disgusting, what a woke thing to do. He's innocent in my eyes, but I don't want to get in trouble with you guys, so go, go do whatever you want with him. Spineless. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die. Notice why they argue, listen, notice why they are indicting Jesus. On what grounds is Jesus worthy of death? Because he made himself the son of God. Jesus Christ was found guilty of being the Son of God. Think of that. You say, well, what's that all about? Listen, in the Jewish mind and in the ancient mind, the Son, the firstborn Son, had all the authority and had all the influence as the Father. They're one. 
And they said, that's it. He's saying that he's God's son. That means he's come from God. People today want to argue about the deity of Jesus. Let them argue about it. They're stupid. They're fools. They're in the corner. Let them be. Jesus himself said, before Abraham ever existed, I am. Ego emi, the eternal one. Everyone was on trial. Rome was on trial. Pilate's on trial. The, the Jewish leadership's on trial. The second thing we see is in verses 8 to 10, and it's this. For this day in history means this, that Pilate had one more chance in that horrific moment of time that we celebrate on this Good Friday evening. John 19, verse 8 says, Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more afraid. And he went again into the praetorium and, Jesus, and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. By the way, that's fulfilling Isaiah 53. He did not speak in his own defense. He was silent. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and power to release you? What an amazing statement. Now Pilate is alone with Jesus face to face. And Pilate is asking this question, where are you from? He's trying to look on the earthly level. He's trying to look for a way out. Where can I send this guy? Where, where are you from exactly? I need, to, I need to find out exactly where you're from. See, who's, see who under me has got jurisdiction somewhere else or see who in Rome has got power over me so they can deal with you. I got to get rid of you. Listen, you trying to wash your hands of Jesus Christ simply means this, that you're washing away an opportunity, a chance to know Jesus. Jesus could have begged him in the moment. Jesus could have pleaded with him in the moment. You and I might have been tempted in our carnality to plead. Jesus, why didn't you plead with him? Jesus will never bend your arm to make you a believer. You know that? Never. Pilate was no dummy. Jesus was 33 years old. Pilate had been around a long time. He knew exactly where Jesus was from. I think it's that deeper meaning to the question, where are you from? They just accused you of being guilty of calling yourself the son of God. Where are you from? You get that? And Jesus, though answering him, didn't answer, but by not answering, did answer. Jesus says, yeah, to your claim of having authority over my life to put me to death or to let me live, um, that's not going to work. How do we know this? Thirdly, look at this. On this day in history, all came under condemnation. Jesus Christ going to the cross on this day in history condemned the entire world. You want to get, listen, there's a lot of cults in this world today that if you mention, that listen, that if you mention to somebody, Jesus loves you and he died on the cross for your sins, you know they might kill you for that. Did you know that? In fact, you don't even have to be involved in, a, in witnessing to a cult. You can talk to somebody who's very arrogant and proud and say, God loves you. And they'll, they'll roll with that. And the moment you say, Jesus died for you on the cross, they're like white on rice. They're furious because you know what you've just said? You've just told them that they need a redeemer, that they need a savior because they're a sinner. And I'm a sinner and you're a sinner. And we're all sinners, the Bible says, and we're condemned. That's why Jesus went to the cross. Because sin is so horrible. And in verse 11, the Bible says, Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Notice he just answered where he's from. You got that? Where are you from? Jesus answers. If you're paying close attention, above. I'm from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me, speaking of Judas now, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. That sounds like a Facebook threat. 
<laughs> and uh, that's called uh, canceling. If you let, th- that's, that's called bullying. If you let this man go, you're not Caesar's friend, implication. If you let this man go, we're going to tell Caesar on you. That's exactly what they meant. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. Dear friends, might I remind you, this is not the Jewish people saying this. This is the Jewish religious leadership saying this. Out of their own mouth, they're saying, we've got to have loyalties to Caesar. And Pilate, you better remember your place in this whole game. I have this uh, file and it's quotes. I just, whenever I have an actual original thought, it's not often. (laughs) I think in, in 66 years, I've got 21 original thoughts, I think, as of today. And I write them down and I put them in a little file called Jack's Quotes. And one of those quotes is, never underestimate a man's ability to justify himself. And that's 100% true. Didn't Satan say, skin for skin, a man will do anything to save his own skin? We'll talk a little bit more of that on, on Sunday, but um, the amazing thing is, one for all, that's Jesus Christ going to the cross. I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase, close enough, almost exact quote, but I love how this gets people angry. Are you ready? I don't think any of you are going to get angry over this, but um, I just love the fact that when I say what I'm about to say, it gets people angry. It gives me great satisfaction to know. <laughs> it's not, it's, but it's not personal. The Bible says that Jesus Christ died for the sins of all mankind. He died for all. He died for all the sins in the world that would ever be committed from Adam and Eve to the last moment of sin in the future. He died to set man free from the grip of sin and of hell and of death. And yet there are some people that, no, no, he didn't die for everybody. He only died for those who will say yes to him. That is a sick thought, my friend, because without Jesus Christ dying for all the world, then there is no justification for hell itself. People who are in hell are in hell because they wanted to go to hell because they did not want God in their life and they chose that path. You may be here today, you may be watching right now and you're saying, I don't want Jesus in my life. That's your choice. Just know this, he died for all your sins. All of your lying, all of your cheating, stealing, moving the decimal point over, adding another zero, looking at your neighbor's husband or your neighbor's wife, going too fast in the free free word. right? He died for all sin. That's why blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not accepting Christ. What, is there an unforgivable sin? Yes, there is. There's only one. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which is rejecting Jesus. That's the sin. People are going to hell today for this one reason. They refuse to come to Christ. And the Bible says that decisions were being made on this day in history. Verses 13 to 14. John chapter 19. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat. This is a terrifying moment. And in place that is called the pavement. But in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover. And about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. What an amazing thing. Now he's sitting down and he's officially, listen, when he sits on that seat in what is called the pavement, by the way, if you've been with us to Israel, we, we take you to not only where the pavement is, but we take you on our tour. We go under the ground, deep, under. Some people can't go. They get claustrophobic. And then we go into this 
room so large that's been there for over 2,000 years and it's where the pavement is. And guess what? One of the gospels records that the Roman centurions casted lots for Jesus' garment. There's a very game that is inscribed that's over 2,200 years old that's inscribed in the stone and it's the very, very game where they would cast their dice for the victims' garments or possessions to take for themselves. And it's right there. And it's over 2,200 years old. But when you sat down on that seat, the power of Rome was behind you. Listen, Barney Fife could pull you over in a squad car. Get out of that car, walk up to you, all 98 pounds of them, shaking his gun. You know who I'm talking about? Does anybody know who Barney Fife is? Oh, wow. So this is the elderly service. Are there any young people in here? Sort of. We're glad you're here. So Barney Fife can be pulling you over and all that kind of stuff. And listen, you may not take Barney seriously. He may look funny and awkward. I bet Pilate, to God, looked funny and awkward sitting on that throne of his, on that judgment seat. But you know what? Barney Fife had a badge on. Listen, you may get pulled over by the CHP and you may not like, you might even know the officer that pulled you over and he might be a bozo. You might know him personally. He could be a family member for all I care. But he didn't pull you over, did he? The authority of the state of California pulled you over. And when he sat on that seat, when Pilate sat there, what he was about to speak was the power of Rome. It was as though Caesar himself was speaking. And Rome said, behold, your king. What a shocking statement. They just told him a moment. Could you just see them? They're like human now. Did you hear what he just said? We just told him that if anybody lets him go or any in association with Jesus, that he's not a friend of Caesar's. He's putting himself again. There's no, we have no king but Caesar. They're going to make that clear in a moment. Decisions are always made wherever Jesus Christ's name is brought up. Always. Somebody could cuss using Jesus' name and you hear it. And the decision is made in your heart, in your mind. You, what you, Lisa and I do, I, I, if, if you ever go to a movie and Lisa and I are in that movie, you're going to know what, we're in the theater. If they say the Lord's name in vain, Lisa and I will say, is Lord. <laughs> Somebody's doing something and somebody says, you know, Tom Cruise says Jesus and Jack and Lisa say, is Lord. And um, it's kind of, you got to listen, you got to do it sometime. It's pretty fun. They can't see you. You're in the dark anyway. Who's going to know? <laughs> Behold your king. Number five on this day in history, gods were being chosen. Choose your God. Is it this mild mannered, bloodied preacher standing before us? Robed in mockery, crown of thorns on his head, as though he were defenseless, he said nothing. The Bible tells us in another place that all of these accusations that they brought against him were all conjured up. Isn't that something? In verse 15, it says, But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? He's really rubbing it in, isn't he? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Ooh. Right then and there. It wouldn't have been great if the ground just opened him up and swallowed that guy right then. And you could hear God burp after it was over. That would have been awesome. We have no king but Caesar. Great earthquake. <laughs> That's what I would have done. Then Pilate delivered him to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. They had him now. Have you ever seen a mob in the Middle East that's fired up with passion? 
According to the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, it's very, very terrifying. It's not bedtime reading. But the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ at this point was marred more than any other human being. The word marred means, in Hebrew, unrecognizable as a human. It means that he only had the form, the shape, the silhouette of a human. You know Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of the Christ, did, did no justice to what happened to Jesus. Imagine putting hamburger into a blender and then taking it out and forming it in the shape of a human. That's what Jesus looked like. A mangled mess of tissue, blood, wounded. But people were choosing their gods in that moment. Rome, myself, religious power, convenience. And there this one, mangled only because he raised the dead, cleansed the lepers, opened the eyes of the blind, and brought to us the kingdom of God and showed us that there's a way to heaven, but religion will kill that. Real quick. Number six, on this day in history, prophecy was being fulfilled. We could go on all night for this, but I got a minute. John nineteen seventeen says, And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called uh, the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him, two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. You know, that was written and put over his head back then. And did you know it's true then and it's true today? It's still true. Jesus Christ is king of the Jews. He's their king. He's my king. He's your king. I'm a monarchist. Are you an independent, Republican, or Democrat? I'm a monarchist. I'm waiting for my king to show up. I hope any time now. The king is coming. He came once to die. He's coming back to judge. I can't wait for him to come. By the way, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, then many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, just north of the city, technically. And it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, verse 21. Therefore, the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but he said, I am the King of the Jews. And finally, Pilate, his wife must have got a hold of him between all this stuff. Because in verse 22, he says, what I have written, I have written. And it's like, where was that spunk earlier? But the word Nazareth is an awesome word. The word means, or the original word is Nasar, and it means uh, a shoot or a root or a branch. The word is also translated a watchtower or overlooker. Someone that overlooks. Imagine like a tall tree overlooking everyone. Or when the word says here, Nazareth, Jesus was from Nazareth. Jesus was from the place of the shoot or the branch. When you chop an olive tree off at the base, no matter how big it is, guess what, guess what happens after about six months? A little shoot comes up out of that ancient tree. And that's the exact same word that's used in the Old Testament regarding the Messiah would be the branch, the shoot that would come from Jesse. Isaiah 11, verse 1. You can read that later. Oh, real quick, time's sake, just for fun. I'm I'm out of time. You guys, uh, map. We have a map. This is very cool. Very, very cool. So you can't see this. The lights are too bright or this laser's too weak. See number one, two, and three. It's obvious. You see this over here, everybody? Okay, this is... This is east, this is west. Can you guys see that? Can you see it over here? Okay, this is east. I'm sorry, this is... This is west, thank you. This is east. This is the Judean wilderness over here. This is the Mount of Olives. Here. This is the Kidron Valley. Here. Garden of Gethsemane. Here. Watch this. This is Mount Olivet. This is Mount Zion. This is Mount Moriah. See where the temple is? 
They led Jesus out of the city. We know it was through the northern gate. We call it today the Damascus gate. And you see that brown spot right there? That's what's called Gordon's Calvary. It's the place of the skull. You see this right here? That is known as uh, Gordon's tomb. Not Gordon's tomb, but Gordon found the tomb. The empty tomb. Jesus was crucified on that high ground right up there. High ground of Moriah. The exact same spot Isaac was offered up by Abraham, living out prophecy. Prophecy being fulfilled. Number seven, I'm going to go real quick. I have to go fast here. For this day in history, nothing written of the scriptures failed. Verses 23 to 24, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier apart, and also the tunic. Now, the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not tear it, because it was very unique, but cast lots for it. Let's gamble for it. Who shall it be? That the scriptures might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among themselves, and for my clothing they did cast lots. Psalm 22. Therefore the soldiers did these things. The Bible never failed. Everything about Christ this day in history was spot on to the moment. Verses 25 to 27 we go on, and that is the family. Listen, on this day in history, the family of faith was born. You and I are in this family I'm about to read. Now there stood by the cross Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, that's John, standing by. Isn't that cute? John writes John's gospel and says (laughs) that I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. (laughs) Pretty cool, right? I'm sure when John wrote his gospel, Matthew probably said, I wish I would have put that in there. I should have put Matthew in there. You ought to be able to say that, by the way. You should say that. You are the disciple whom Jesus loves. He said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Jesus said that to her. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home, the family of God. The family of God is born out of the suffering of Jesus. Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, Yeshua, Yahushua, Yeshua, our Messiah. Number nine, there's only 10. Number nine, on this day in history, the law of God was satisfied. A lot of people think we're against the law of God. We're not against the law of God at all. It's holy and pure and perfect. We're learning that in the book of Romans. God's law is awesome. By the way, you know the nation of Israel existed for thousands of years and never had a police department. <laughs> Did you know that? Until they, uh, It's not been since 1949 or 1950. Did Israel have a police department? Did you know that? Think about that. They didn't have any enforcers. You want to know why? Because the law in every home was the enforcer of how a home and a husband and a family should conduct itself among one another, the culture, and God. You've got that in the heart, and you've got a, a, you've got a culture that's under control. John Adams said regarding the United States of America as a prophet, think about what he said. He said this Constitution is only fit for a moral and a religious people and it is impossible to govern any other. And you're watching our nation fall apart because we've killed God and we've removed him from our nation. And we're reaping now and we're going to reap the judgment of having saying goodbye to God. And what steps in the place is more government, more government, more laws, Listen, we have more laws now in our nation than any other time in history. How are we doing? It's because the heart. No, God's law is holy and beautiful and awesome, but we can never satisfy it. But Jesus did. 
After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine and put on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it's finished. Wow, it's all done, man, I'm telling you. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Nobody does this but God. Listen, when you and I die, we're going to die when our body says, I'm, die- I'm dead. I'm not going to say, you know what? I'm going to die now. <laughs> but you know what Jesus did? Jesus said, it's finished. You should ask the question, what's finished? I just finished paying the price of all of mankind's sins. It's finished. And I said, yeah, amen. And... Uh, And it being finished, I dismissed my spirit. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm not hanging around this place one more second. Jesus gave up his spirit. Amen. Number 10, on this day in history, everything changed forever. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, meaning it was a double Sabbath. It was a very unusual day, that Passion Week. It was a double Sabbath, very unique. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away, because if you break their legs, then they can't push up on the spike. That's how you breathe. You pushed up on the spike that was in your feet to catch your breath. Then you rested back down on the spike. And then you exhaled. Then you pushed up on the spike. Well, if you break their legs, they had a mallet, they had like a sledgehammer. They would break your legs so you couldn't push up. And you would suffocate rather abruptly. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with them. Verse 33, but when they came to Jesus... And saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And immediately blood and water came out. That means Jesus. I'm not joking. I'm not being cute. A cardiologist in here will know this this to be true. And they would have the medical term for it. When this says blood and water came out of Jesus' side. When they pierced his heart through the rib cage. It means that Jesus actually died of a strangled or broken heart. The the fluid filled up around his heart so unusually due to all of the suffering that that medical condition just crushes the heart. It would have killed him. But remember what he said earlier? Nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down. And I take it up again. Is that amazing? Isn't that awesome? What a beautiful thing. And immediately blood and water came out. And he who was seen has testified. And his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth. So that you may believe. Friends, you need to believe if you don't. Your faith better quickly be anchored in Jesus and him alone. This is a warning out of love to all who are here right now. Nobody can tell us what's going to happen in this world next. But I can tell you this, if you trust Christ tonight, you can be in heaven forever with God no matter what happens in this world. (laughs) Trust him tonight. I'm going to ask Marty to come on out, but you remain right where you're at. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads in prayer. As we prepare our hearts for communion tonight, church, I'm going to ask you that maybe tonight, if you agree with what I'm about to say to you and invite you to participate in, if you agree, then guess what? You partake of communion tonight with us. But I must say, communion is strictly reserved for those who understand that Jesus died for their sins and rose again from the dead. Now, to get the rest of the story, you've got to come back on Sunday. So we need to hope and pray that the weather cooperates because 
We need a lot of seats. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight and we ask in the name of Yeshua. We ask you, Lord, that the truth of your word, we saw very, very quickly tonight, the truth of your word, the power of your word, the fulfillment of prophecy, the fact that Jesus, his very presence, his very name requires a decision. Always. That somebody tonight might know and respond and believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins personally. That you love them personally. You know them personally. You've always known them. And you've been waiting for them. And tonight is their night. Whoever you may be, wherever you may be, if you're watching right now, wherever you're at, if the Holy Spirit has taken this simple message and has spoken to your heart inside of you, and you can sense the kindling of faith, pray this prayer wherever you're at right now, from here and beyond. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess tonight, today, wherever you are, I confess, Lord, today that you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. Because I couldn't be saved, you saved me. Because I was lost, you found me. And because I was condemned, you made me pure by your own blood. And I receive you tonight as my risen Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, my King, my Lord, my Savior. And we pray in Jesus' name. Church family, I'm going to ask you, um, as we end this, well, I mean, we're not ending it right now. We're going to have communion right now. But uh, as we do this tonight, Marty's going to lead us in song and You guys respond and knowing this, that the bread right here, the bread, the matzah, it's just a symbol. It's not his body. It's bread symbolizing his body. The cup is juice. It's not blood symbolizing his new covenant. So tonight as we worship, May God bring you healing and blessing and peace. As you make your way, right? We're, handy, we're, ha- we're having them come forward, right? Don't, there's, ta- there's tables in the back, you guys, but don't stampede. There's no reason. Don't worry. But we love it this way, though. This is a huge crowd. It's personal. And I understand those of you who are in the overflow and out in the courtyard areas that you'll have communion available for you out there as well. But make your way. And we won't, we won't stop until you, ha- you have opportunity. But you make your way and you grab the cup and you grab the bread and you say, Lord, thank you for dying for me. And with this, Lord, I receive your forgiveness and your healing and your love. And Lord, I renew this covenant with you. And quite frankly, it's, Lord, I'm one with you. It's almost as though you're saying to his overture he says to you will you be mine and by this cup tonight you're saying back to him I will be yours Lord it's you and I he wants to come into your life and so for those of you who know Christ even now you may have come to Christ make your way to the table if you don't know how to pray listen to those that are standing around you steal a prayer from them learn how to do it In Jesus' name. Who has believed our reports? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
He grew up among us, a tender shoot, a root from dry ground. In him no beauty we found. Scorned and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, like one from whom men hide their faces. Not esteemed, but denied. Not desired, but. Despised, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace fell on him. And by his stripes we are healed. We are healed. Like a sheep before shearers is silent. As a lamb led to slaughter, he said not a word. A sign the grave with the wicked, though no evil he done, no no deceit was on his tongue. He was. Transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisements for our peace fell on him, and by his stripes we are healed. Yes, through. Have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. Our iniquity on him was laid. Surely he has borne our grief. And our sorrows, he has borne our griefs. And our sorrows, Yeshua, you were wounded. For our transgressions, Lord, you were bruised for our iniquity, the chastisement that brought us peace. It fell on thee, and by thy stripes we are healed. Oh, yes, oh. Have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. But our iniquity on you, Lord, was laid. Surely you have borne our griefs 
and our sorrows. You have borne our sins. You bore our diseases. You have borne our griefs and our sorrows. Yes, you were wounded for our transgressions. You were bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace, it fell on thee and by thy strife. We are healed. Through thy wounds, we are healed. By thy stripes, through your wounds, Lord. Wash me clean, Lord. Wash me clean. Let my feet walk close beside you. Wash me clean, Lord. Wash me clean. So with you I always will abide. Let my heart know with deep compassion all the things that you require of me. Let my mind know with full assurance all the things that you desire. I do. Wash me clean, Lord. Wash me clean, touch my feet with your anointing, that I may gleam, Lord, that I may gleam, that much brighter now to shine. Let my feet walk close beside you. Wash me clean, Lord, wash me clean. So in you I always will abide. Let my heart know with deep compassion all the things that you require of me. Let my mind know with full assurance all the things that you desire I do yes wash me clean Lord wash me clean touch my feet with your anointing that I may gleam Lord that I may that much brighter now to shine for you. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus 
no turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Still I will follow No turning back No turning back The world behind me The cross before me The world behind me The cross before me the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Said the one they called King of the Jews, truly, this was the Son of God, said the Roman soldier, marveling at the way he died. The love of God Can you see on that tree The love of God The love of God The love of God There for you, there for me the love of God. He bleeds for you. He pleads for you who are needy to let him be the love of God. The love of God, can you see on that tree the love of God? He gave all for you, here in call to you, you are weary, come.
church, let's all stand together, would you? So here's the deal. We'll never do that again. With the, <laughs> I mean, it was great, but not with two services tonight. We love you. Um, we, yes, we need you to leave as soon as immediately, but... <laughs> No, no, it's my fault. You can blame the Jewish guy if you want. No, we actually don't believe in that. You know that. No, it was my fault. I went went too much. But he wrote such a big book. It's, Lord, it's the book you gave us. (laughs) Father, we pray your blessings upon these, your people, those both here and, and afar. God, we pray that as they go out, may they be filled with your peace. And Father, as they make their way to their cars, keep them safe. Lord, especially in light of second service trying to come in, may there be patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control, the fruit of the Spirit. May we be able to smell the fruit of the Spirit all over this place. (laughs) Lord, we love you. We thank you. We know that this was an amazing, amazing sad day for your disciples. Little did they know. Little did they remember, actually. May tomorrow be a day of great reflection for all of us. And then come Sunday morning, should you grant us the ability, Father, with, I mean, at least we'll be in this main sanctuary. We'll pack it out. But Lord, we're going to come with excitement. We're going to come with joy and absolute absolute thanksgiving. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. God bless you. You need to go. See you.